how are you supposed to interrogate the gatekeepers when the interrogators are themselves gatekeepers? Yes. It's there's sort of there's a sense to which the people who was who were supposed to hold culture to account are compromised by association. Yes, and what we've so Arts Emergency has been part of uh, partnering with some research into social class and inequality in the arts. And one of the things that they've found is basically that people within the arts and culture makers really believe that the arts are a meritocracy. And the people who believe it most are white people from wealthy backgrounds. Um, because they have benefited most from it. Yeah. <laughs> and the people who don't believe it are people who have been the victims of uh, structural disadvantage. Um, and as a result, how do you change that when people are going, no, no, it's really fair. Like, I worked really hard and here I am, wealthy and successful. <laughs> <laughs> it's, re it's really difficult to... I mean, I think the only way to do it is to kind of create a platforms by which you can share stories from people with other from other backgrounds to try and convince people that actually it isn't just plain sailing and the cream always rises to the top and i mean we i think i think that we're very lucky in terms of the arts community because ultimately stand up comedy is something that requires very low overheads so ultimately if you can as long as you can keep yourself alive you can do stand-up comedy so it's like as long as you so I I had to do a office job for five years um, where I was sort of you know you go into it's like a, you're like a reverse Superman like you kind of you go into work and then you sort of go into like a phone box and you come out as someone with low employment prospects like <laughs> and then you sort of like run to do a gig oh yeah yeah it's like you sort of you know you like deliberately make yourself disheveled so that you can go and do comedy but that the privilege I think of being a comedian is that you can do that and if you're an actor or if you're if you're going into theatre or visual arts or something that requires some overheads or an investment initially or filmmaking for example that's where you really need to you know that's where it gets really difficult yeah and also what, what the research found is that the creative industries rely so heavily on unpaid internships yeah and they spin this narrative that that's the sound of a room full of people like, <laughs> who have all just realized that they're three months away from applying for a load of unpaid internships <laughs> oh. <laughs> I saw the most amazing thing online, uh, which was a tweet that said, uh, unpaid internships are a wonderful opportunity. Stay with me. Apply for them, interview for them, get them, and then sack them off. You've practiced your interview technique. <laughs> <laughs> and it's wasted their valuable time. <laughs> and I was like, so good. But, um, the fact that the, uh, the narrative as well of, you know, people want to say, oh, if you want to be an artist, you've got to struggle, you've got to starve, and all that stuff, which is a lovely fantasy to have. Yeah, sure. But actually, the truth of it is, if you want to get into the creative industries and you have to do an unpaid internship for three months, only the smallest proportion of people can manage that. Like, how could anyone who isn't being supported by rich, wealthy parents within London yeah. do that? Yeah, I mean, I think the only answer to that is you have to kind of create s communities yourselves. And I mean, I, I, the best example of that that I can think of is something that someone else did. And it's very easy for me, it's easier for us to talk about someone else and an example of how someone sort of created a community through sheer initiative and force of will. So our very good friend, Nikesh Shirkler, who is a graduate of this establishment, uh, he, uh, a few years ago, he's, he was an author, he is still an author, but he's now author and cultural powerhouse, I yeah. think is his full job yeah. title. <laughs> but he, he recognised a kind of structural imbalance in publishing where, you know, the number of novels that get published by minority of any description, and I include, for some weird reason, women in the word minority. <laughs> yeah, you know, like most of the planet. Yeah, the 51% um, yeah, minority. Yeah, the 51% minority, yeah. Um, he sort of noticed an imbalance and, he, you know, as, as somebody who'd grown up in a kind of Asian household, he had sort of grown up not really, re not really understanding how someone like him would get into it and he'd sort of fought by hook or by crook to be published as a novelist. And he kind of pushed through this initiative um, called The Good Immigrant, which was a, uh, an anthology of essays by immigrant authors. And he was turned away by all of the gatekeepers and he turned to kind of online crowdfunding and ended up funding the whole thing. And now that the success of that book has sort of led to an agency specifically formed for um, minority writers 
and but a what journal, he, a well. journal as well, and what and he, an American uh, yeah, and an American anthology of immigrant and a TV essays. Series in development. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I'm up to date with our friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but that I think that is the only way to correct these kind of structural imbalances is to sort of create your own creative communities and support each other yes. because if you're coming from a background that isn't basically rich white man. You, if you're coming from working class background, ethnic minority, it, or if you're trying to write about an experience that's outside of the norm, you will not be supported by the system. And so you have to create systems amongst yourselves that support you. And what's really thrilling about it is you'll know the success of it shows the hunger for it. Mm. The success of it shows the audience that is sat there just desperately waiting for something that actually represents them, interests them, represents the world. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's quite thrilling about now. And what I always think is thrilling about, like, I put it in the context of stand-up, but in any creative practice is, it's creative. You have the power to create something. Yeah, sure. You may not yet have the power to break through to the mainstream instantly in a way that your white, male, straight, rich counterparts may, but you do have the power to make something brilliant, and that is sort of the start and the most important part. Yeah, and then once you have broken through, the most important thing is to create a chain behind you. So I, I just read the other day that Ryan Coogler is using some of the profits of Black Panther to set up scholarships for African-American film students. And so it's, it's, it's not just about breaking through, it's once you've broken through, uh, looking at the path that you may have had to bulldoze through and throw a line back so people can build a pathway through the line that you had to create by essentially just running into walls for years and years. And I should say that's what Arts Emergency exists to do, like part of our ethos is about like if you accrue a certain type of privilege or you have a certain type of privilege, it's about trying to share that and, and please, if anyone here would like to become involved, we would love to have you, it would mean a lot to us as an organisation. It's funny to me that you and I, who are people who have benefited from a lot of educational privilege, yeah. um, so we're both grammar school kids from South London suburbs, uh, you are from the vastly inferior borough of Croydon, whereas I'm from Bromley. <laughs> and we're, what, what county is Bromley in? The worst county, the worst one. Although It's I'm in Kent. <laughs> I would like to advocate that it is technically no longer in Kent. It is not in Kent, it is not in London. Well, it's, it's all been to like Monaco. Waiting to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's all been to declare itself a city state, <laughs> like, like the Vatican. <laughs> so, instead of being a tax haven, it's a haven from culture. <laughs> place visit is only six, never go. It's the, the Monaco of ignorance. <laughs> oh, so we're, we're from the... Yeah, that's right, yeah. It's, of... it's a kind of... Josie and I went to the sort of... We went to... I went to the boys' school, she went to the girls' school that were sort of down the road from each other. And they were kind of elite grammar schools yeah. that we got into, and then we both went to kind of elite universities, and what came from that... What is interesting about that is we are still very much, I would say, non-traditional people to be in the media in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I, I would think you it's great. Yeah, it's a depressing realization. There was an old, I think it's a Tina Fey line from an interview when she was talking about being a woman in comedy, and she said something like, "Only in the world of television comedy does a middle-class white woman from Philadelphia count as a diversity hire." <laughs> and I feel very similar about me. I mean, sure, brown. <laughs> Classic. But like there's still I've still come from a lot of sort of educational privilege and but it's only because my I'm what we don't have is independent familial wealth that could have kind of sustained us. Or that, connections to the industry. Or connections to the industry, yes. Or so kind of private school education. Like what's interesting is I think even with the comedy industry, which hitherto has been a place where uh, like you say, it's kind of open entry. Yeah, sure. I still find that, as a consequence, possibly, of the last 10 years of education reforms mm. under the Conservatives, you do feel that it's becoming more rarefied. Like, I can now list multiple Etonians in comedy. Yeah, yeah. That's fucked up. <laughs> yeah. That's not yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, when it comes to culture, none of these people are bad. They're good. Okay, possibly one of them is bad. I'm not going to do But the fact is... 
None of these people are bad, but all of their counterparts who never had any elite education or who suffer from the structural disadvantages of, uh, you know, intersecting things yeah. are just as fucking good. And yeah. it is not their ideas that are being fast tracked in it. It's not their ideas that are being showcased. And I sort of want to, you know, the warning of culture is if you only have people from a rarefied background, the only music you can have is Mumford and Sons. <laughs> Are you okay with that, Britain? Is that what you want? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're very nice, but come on. So, they're not. So. <laughs> oh, you want receipts? I've got receipts. He told Laura Marling. <laughs> okay, none of you care about Laura Marling. Fine. I'm a 35 year old mum. That's where I sit now. <laughs> question I'd ask you. Yeah. How do you feel the state of culture is at the moment in this country? Do you feel confident about it? Do you feel pleased about it? I mean, I think, unfortunately, look, I, I think that there's so much amazing stuff being produced in spite of structural obstacles that are put in the way. It's like life in, like, that line in Jurassic Park where it's like life finds a way. Like, people find ways of getting round obstacles that are put in their path. And I still believe that there is excellent stuff being produced by people from backgrounds who aren't necessarily, you know, it's not sort of laid out in front of them. I mean, I think in terms of, in terms of comedy, there's just from a sort of brown perspective, there's way more of us now. When I first started going to Edinburgh, and Edinburgh is the sort of, the big comedy festival, and if you haven't been there, it's a really weird experience, because when you get there, the entire town is kind of occupied by this sort of Stalinist cult of personality, where there are these huge posters of all of the comedians all over an entire city, and the people of Edinburgh hate it. <laughs> Absolutely hate it, but there are huge posters everywhere. And the only thing, the thing that those posters are really useful measure of is who is currently doing comedy and where comedy is at. And when I first started going, the only posters for the first couple of years that weren't white men were basically like you and Reg Hunter. Like they were the only, there were very few visible faces for, that weren't white men. And now when you go I'm there. Say, I'm still white. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's I'm not implying Josie is some sort of Rachel Dolezal figure. Like, I... <laughs> that's, that's so fucked up. And also, yeah. again, it's, you know, it's the same thing of if, if people aren't challenged in these things, they take it for granted, they don't think yeah. that they're ensconced in their own perspective. And, like, even down to kind of... When I was growing up, most of the comedians I watched were men and I would have to do little somersaults in my head. Like, Bill Hicks, when I was a teenager, I was like, wow. And yet he would talk so much in a derogatory way about women or mm. in ways that made me feel really sick and uncomfortable when I'd be like... I suppose if I'm in this scenario, I'm him, but I wouldn't be quite so misogynist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and like people who've never had to perform that kind of mental gymnastics yeah. don't appreciate everyone who is doing that. But I think there are, I mean, in terms of comedy now, yeah. there are certainly more, because we, when I was growing up, I'm 33, so when I was about 12 years old, goodness gracious me, he was on television. <laughs> and like, you know, even all throughout my childhood, like I, I saw Lenny Henry, like in the street, and I, I didn't realise the extent to, no, no. I saw him in Edinburgh uh, doing the fringe, oh, and I didn't realise like uh, when I saw him, I saw him and look, I thought I was seeing like a beloved uncle. <laughs> like I hugged him, and I don't know him, <laughs> and he did not look comfortable. But it, because those people were on television, there was a li there was a sense of like that. It just puts the thing in your brain of oh, this is something that's available to me to do. And do you feel like once the door has been opened, there's one direction of traffic? I, I, I mean, I hope so. I hope that things have shifted and that, but it's only, that what it's about is people like me, and this is the sort of position that I'm finding myself in, if I get the chance to select writers' rooms, making sure that there are people of colour in there and making sure that there are women in there and making sure that we're representing different views and you sort of, you, you know, you kind of, there's a bit of necessary myth making when you do become, and I don't even mean successful, I mean financially sustainable. The second you become like a comedian, there's a part of you, the day you finish your last day of doing an office job, 
which is like that's the sort of success of being in the arts I think the day you do that there's a part of you that needs to think I did this myself mm. and so then there's the, the initial hurdle as soon as that happens especially if you've had some obstacle placed to you because of your background your first thing is to be like well I did it so why they should do it and then realise that, like, that's not how anything works. And also, I would say the flip side of that is when you come up against uh, gatekeeping over and over again, when all your ideas are turned down, it's really, really hard then not to go, this is on me too. You yeah. Know, when, when it isn't, you know, there, there are these ways that the industry favours certain people and does not favour others. And so uh, I think it's, it's a really funny thing to hold your course yeah, it, in it's a tough, and then, it, and then things happen that really... I, I, the more I look back on it, the more I realise how much I was held back by something that and my first agent said to me, where I, she came to the sh uh, watch me do stand-up, and she said, this is very sort of, you know, it's a bit much on the race thing. <laughs> um, and, I mean, God, I, that, back then I was, I was sort of like, hey, my parents are Indian. That's funny. And that was, I mean, I would love to see her cover watch we do stand up now because I think she would have a heart attack. Like, but then she, and she said it's a bit much on the race thing. And I was like, okay. And I, you know, I was 22 or whatever it is. And then she asked me to audition for a sitcom where I was supposed to do an Indian accent. And that was the one thing that I said I would never, never do because I never wanted to be in a position where I was selling out my entire ethnicity and he cultural heritage for the sake of and it wasn't like you know it's not the it's not black panther you know it's not michael b jordan playing kill it's not like it's not you know t'challa it was a stupid part that where, where the joke was this guy has an indian accent and he's indian and that's funny and so i refused to do it and she then dropped me basically because of that to be fair you could have been in the big bang theory <laughs> yeah that that it was it was basically that it was a part not unlike that just in a show that would have been much less successful and she uh I, she it's so grim that that's yeah. again like if you look at that from the state of this is a person in a position of power who does not understand your experience yeah. and who does not even bother trying yeah. to empathize it does yeah. you know and that's the sort of thing you can be up against without like trying to sound too negative i think it is very difficult if you know if everyone's coming from the same pool yeah they don't appreciate the reasons why other people are affected by certain things or you know even though that should be pretty fucking obvious but at the same time yeah and, and absolutely and the only reason i got through that was there was no you know i think when i was younger i was always obsessed with the idea that there would be a mentor figure that somebody would sort of and in and in later years i have met people like oh there he is Rob. rob's back you know, you and I have both been sort of semi-mentored by Stuart Lee at various points in our lives, and like as I got older. But certainly for the first few years, I think I was hoping that at some point someone from within the system would come out and offer an olive branch to me. And actually, on reflection, that never happened. And where the support came from was from my peers. And I, I made it through the first few years because of the support of my friends and my kind of and that's the if there's anything that i can say to you it's have each other's backs like you are each other's most important resource both in terms of professional assistance and just oh, sorry i just looked across and a girl just went, just looks at another girl just tapped her like that <laughs> i think i'm gonna cry <laughs> But it, you are each other's most important resource and, you know, regardless of what your background is or what, where you come from, you, are, you, ha you have to have your friends' backs and you have to constantly know that you are supported by your friends. And, you know, we have these, like, homicidally close friendships, I would say. <laughs> Because we, we, all the people we started with are the people who kind of, you know... And people that you could let off steam to and yes, have each other's exactly. back. And also, like, the thing that I would say is delight in each other's successes. Yeah. Because I know there is the tendency within many industries to tokenise people and then you feel, you know, like, it's stressful and scary. But if you delight in each other's successes, it, 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 everybody benefits, everybody shines. And similarly, like, you know, with you, you're in your position and now you are offering work. You're, you're being the figure that you never had. Sure. And that's really important. Sure. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, we, yeah, it is, it's the, the most important thing. And any time I see, there is just this, I think because of the arts as well, because of the way things end up, 
we sort of really prioritise celebrating individual achievement because ultimately the way that you measure success is by an individual who gets an award or whatever and you don't really realise that I've not encountered a single person who's been successful in any artistic field without a supportive community uh, behind them. And so, yeah, I, th I mean, that's, I think that's the most... And also, it's almost like you want to go, you made it through! You yeah, did yeah, it. yeah, exactly. You yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And with that, um, I would love to open the floor up if there's any questions for Nish. It'd be really great. Um, we've got roving microphones. We've actually got three roving microphones, so please, wherever you sat, push the boat out. Um, thank you very much, Claire. Uh, I just, it's a really simple one. A lot of what you said, Nish, I just I wasn't laughing because it springs you down so much. I'm, I'm a strong believer that a rising tide lifts all ships, so in your view, then are we all sunk? Because... <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I don't... I mean, I don't think... I think I have... I think the funny thing about... I think people think that I'm very cynical. <laughs> but actually, I am always an optimist. Like, I'm a real... You know... That's why you're upset. Yeah, that's why I'm upset. I, 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 it's not because I... If you're cynical... I wish I was more cynical because then I'd be sat here now going, and I have, we have friends who are like this, who are like, yep, of course, this is how it was always going to go, this is the worst. But the only reason I'm so angry is because I think we are capable of so much better. Dr Phil, Dr Phil says the reason you're unhappy is not the things that happen, it's the difference between what you hope to happen and what would happen. <laughs> that man is not even a real doctor. He's not a doctor! He just changed his name by deed poll to doctor. Um, but that is a really good point. That, that's exactly where the kind of crushed... I think the angriest people are people who've had their optimism squashed in the last few years. But I do... The thing that I... So I asked Rennie Edo Lodge, who's a great writer, who wrote a book called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, which is a brilliant book. I asked her about where she derives optimism. Because to me, Rennie is someone who's like... She's really looking at the heart of darkness, you know, in terms of a lot of what she's written about in the last few years. And her whole thing is that, that people are so much more engaged now. Like, when, when we were growing up, there was a sense that politics wasn't really something that affected your day-to-day -day life. And now we're in a position where children are walking out of school to protest climate change. I mean, sure, some of them are just, like, <laughs> fucking... <laughs> day off but like <laughs> there is a real there's been a real politicization of young people and that's the thing that i get optimism from i really feel like the, the generation that's coming up now uh, you know teenagers and you people are so much more politically aware and engaged unfortunately people like someone like me has to have left it in a sense too late like i uh, brexit happened suddenly i was like oh this is bad <laughs> that's like me in 2010 i was like whoa yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah. I, I read a really great book called, um, come on, let me know this. I love the fact that you just reeled off a word perfect Dr. Phil quote. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, everyone's a different type of learner. <laughs> I read a great book called How to Lose a Country by Eche Temokiran, and um, she's from Turkey. She's a journalist who was vilified there. She's seen her country descend from a democracy into a dictatorship, and she's basically like, guys, I'm the, gro uh, the ghost of Christmas past. <laughs> uh, ghost of Christmas yet to come. And it's really, really intense and very sad, and it, I think there are real parallels to here and in the States, and it's frightful. But in it, she says, when people say, oh, how do you feel optimistic? I look at what young women are doing. Mm. And I think that's like, always a very exciting thing you know like uh, something like a few years ago I was feeling really low and then Sisters Uncut formed yeah. and I was like fuck yeah. yes children do it and the same with the school strikes it started out with young women and yeah. obviously I do think that 14 year old girls are very mean so it's you know it's, <laughs> it's touch and go but at the same time yeah when uh, Galdem magazine did the takeover of the Guardian weekend yes. magazine you're like that is Fucking cool. This is a group of people that just started out and found that there were gatekeepers in the way and so bulldozed through them by sheer collective will and through cooperation. And then they come to a point where they're doing a takeover of the Guardian magazine and kind of landing quite squarely in the sort of beating heart of liberal Britain. And you go, that is... So I find the actions of young people 
uh, cause for inspiration. And I suppose what, the other big tenet of arts emergency is foster a sense of entitlement because that is what gets eroded from you uh, when you are not upper class. That's what gets eroded from you by having to encounter discrimination on a daily basis. Your sense of entitlement gets taken from you and you have to foster the entitlement mm. of fucking Boris Johnson, the worst cunt in London. <laughs> and you take that entitlement and you use it for good. Yeah. And so you look at like Gail Dem, you look at a uh, good Im- immigrant, you look yeah. at all these things and what they've done is they've gone, right, the gatekeepers aren't letting us through. Yeah. And then what happens is it rises. The gatekeepers pretend they were interested. Yeah. In the <laughs> but as a result, the gatekeepers have to respond because it has been proven a success. And it is not fair that you are not given those, you may not be given those opportunities by conventional routes. But if you can power through, you will eventually be given those opportunities. And you can be like, I told you so. Um, Are there any more questions? Oh, there's loads. This is what happens, the pioneer. She smashed through. She smashes through. Asking British people if they want to do a Q and A is like the worst thing Hi, you can do. Um, great set, really good talk. Um, Thanks, buddy. <laughs> it's nice to open like that. What's yours? <laughs> um, kind of a general question. You've maybe covered it a little bit, but like, what would you advise be to somebody who's maybe like trying to break through and stand and maybe getting a few paid gigs but wants to make a career out of it? I mean, the the problem with when somebody asks you for advice about being a stand up. It, the answer is, I wish that there was some magic bullet that I could give you that just is like, oh, it was this. You know, like cheat code or something, but it isn't, it's just stage time. It's wherever you can get, it's wherever you, I mean, you, you got the big dog. This is bullshit. You, you've been doing it for longer than me, and well, you know well, what you, but it's just, but that's right, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not talking nonsense. No, yeah. I, what I would say is, um, don't assume there is a set path, because yeah. when I was quite young, I looked at a couple of comedians and went, I want to emulate them. And then a few years later, I'd been emulating them in terms of where they went. And I was like, oh, but I'm not them. And yeah. they've done that and they've moved on. I don't know where I am. All you can do is find your own voice and hone it. Uh, uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, completely. And then like someone like Josie was a bit of a sort of pioneer for a certain group of comedians. Oh, yeah. Don't be, don't be influential. Be successful because then you can buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my 30s. I shouldn't be renting anymore. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, yeah, it's about... So when I was... uh, I saw... I probably saw Josie just stand up for the first time when I was about 21, 22. And you kind of go, oh, that's, you know, that's somebody whose work I'd like to... I'd like to be like that. But not imitate them, but at least look at how they've carved, carved their own kind of path and then try and work out what your version of that is. But the way to get to that, the most boring thing in the world is just stage time. And it's wherever you can get stage time. And it's, fi- it's finding a way to be comfortable in front of people. Yeah. And that it doesn't, it, there's no right way to do it. So there's, you know, yeah, there's no right way to do it. And also if you're doing something unusual, you might, pardon me, die on your ass every day for years. But if you love what you're doing and you feel it's right, just fucking keep going. Yeah. Because eventually you'll have moderate success. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be playing. Oh, this, I mean, I'm not talking Russell Howard, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, mother won't be proud, but you'll step mother. <laughs> Sorry. There's a man in the middle. There's a man in the middle with a. A very nice T-shirt. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, I really like your discussion. I thought one word was missing, and that word was socialism. Because um, I thought you identified. Thank you, my comrade. <laughs> I think you identified um, structural issues really by in terms of privilege and uh, barriers and so on. But I don't think you identified the structural solution. I mean, uh, we have an opportunity to um, radically transform this country at this particular moment in history, which we haven't had in my whole lifetime. So that, for me, is something that I, I expect you know, a lot of people to get behind. Um, and I think it also relates to the Brexit argument as well, because um, even if you overturn the Brexit decision and you have a referendum, you remain in Europe, all you're doing is getting back to the status quo. You haven't changed the society that we currently live in, that, as you identify all the problems with it. So, can I Do you say like socialism? First, 
first and foremost, I'd like to thank you very much for representing the British left by doing more of a speech than a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm joking, I'm joking, I loved it, I loved it! No, no, I loved it! No, no! <laughs> you don't give it a bike! No, sir! This is not a back and forth! That's interesting. I'm joking, maybe it's a joke. No, no, I didn't, I said that. No, I'm joking, I agree with you, stop, stop. No, no, it was a joke. I agree with you, and if you'd have let me speak, you would have heard. Now, I agree with you because uh, what's interesting, and to bring it back to the research, a lot of the people in culture in Britain want, are, are categorised as left-leaning, right? But the research proves that they work and socialise in homogenous groups, they mistake structural privilege for individual merit, as we've discussed, mm. and they uh, believe unpaid work is an inevitable first step to success, right? So this well-meaningness, this leftiness, becomes just a badge of, are you nice? I'm left, I'm a mm. nice person, I must be left-wing, I'm nice. Oh, I, you know, oh sure, I believe all that shit about stuff, but I don't want anything to change, because if stuff changed, I would get the boot, mm. and I can't see the need for change, because I refuse to acknowledge it's ne- it, it is necessary. That was a tautology, but I said yeah. it convincingly. Um, <laughs> so, like, I personally do believe that, you know, that that is the answer. I would love for us to have a socialist government. I am completely unashamed in saying that, and I get a lot less television work. Um, But (laughs) what I would also say is that in terms of socialist tenets, controlling the means of production is something that creatives have. It's so rare in any industry that you intrinsically control the means of production. So you have the ability to make things as you wish, and you have the ability to build things in a manner that is cooperative, as we say, that isn't competitive, that isn't based around capital or the accruing of capital, and that's a real thrill for me. And I would also say that culture, you know, culture does not exist to be uh, capitalised upon. Culture and capital have a like, difficult relationship, but the idea of the arts... Uh, Kurt Vonnegut said the arts aren't a way to make a living they are a very humane way of making life more more bearable and Arts Emergency says that we have things that are bigger and better than money and we have things that those in power will never understand and I think it is valuable to put annex on the line somewhat politically and say that we are candle holders for a different and a better and a purer world and that we are able to be idealists, and we are able to forge forward. And in my part, I feel that that is being earnest politically sometimes. Other people don't don't necessarily feel that. I think you feel that in in your own voice. Um, But, uh, so to answer your question, I would love it. But uh, I think there are other elements that in a slightly more amorphous way are already here and already very meaningful on a daily basis and very anti-capitalist. Like, art is about joy and carnival and remove from uh, the transactional nature of other things. And art also is about freedom and passion that goes beyond your personal financial or uh, circumstances or class boundaries. And in that respect, it is very, very dangerous and exciting and revolutionary. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I, I have to say, I think, um, sorry, uh, yeah, I think I kind of assumed that everyone thought we thought that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, listen, I host a show that was described by the Daily Mail as a mouthpiece for the Labour Party. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I absolutely agree with everything you said. Yeah, it's, you know, yes, Thanks. we're all. Um, it would be nice to maybe do a couple more questions. I think we've yeah, got yeah. time. Oh, right two more, yeah. Oh, yeah, you've been waiting, so... Here comes the mic. Um, I was just thinking about um, what you were saying earlier about uh, entitlement and that sense of entitlement. Um, and I was just wondering because uh, I'm not sure if I'm anyone, but sometimes as a person who is, we're, we're at a very, um, we're at a kind of duality, I feel, at the moment where we, there, there's a big divide between those who like you know, the elite who, you know, all this politically correct nonsense and, you know, you know that all that, that their type of people don't say that sort of stuff, all this, you know, it's all rubbish, elementary saying it is, and, you know, that type of very rightly, right sort of thing. And then there are, you know, the more progressive people saying, you know, we should be, you know, loads more people of colour and, you know, and even as far as much like privilege. 
And I think the thing is because we live in this time where that's so much, when you're not on the right side, of no sense of guilt or I'm saying, hold on, am I not being accepted into say an industry because I'm, you know, say for example, the, you know, from a, 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 a Asian minority, is a minority ethnic, or because I'm disabled, or am I just shit? And, <laughs> No, no, this is no. And, and it's like, and it's like, am I being that really bitchy character? Like, actually, you're discriminating, and it's it's that constant sense of guilt, and which I would argue is the lack of feeling of entitlement. Because I don't yeah. you know if you were, I'm sure if you were a white man, you know, a white, you know, rich man, then you wouldn't think, you wouldn't even be thinking, oh, I am privileged. You just Exactly. Uh, but also what I'd say is there's plenty of people who are very successful who are really shit, so don't let that hold you down. It is not, I tell you what... I'm sat right here, Josie. <laughs> but um, there's a book called The Artist's Way, which is quite hippie, but it's quite fun. It's about empowering artists. And she basically says that it is not your job as the artist to judge yourself. It's your job as the artist to make art. It's not up to you to say, oh, actually, I've been held back all these times, I'm shit. It's your job as an artist to say, I have a song in my heart, I'm going to fucking sing it. And the world judging you, you can't... Do you know yeah, what I mean? Because it's, some yeah. critics are idiots. It doesn't mean their reviews are right. No, it's also this like... This guy's going out to make art now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably... It is the hardest... Like, it's a great idea for a game show, is this structural prejudice or am I just bad? <laughs> like, it's such a good idea for a game show. <laughs> oh, it's like, you could be a guest going, yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> you're shit. You're shit. <laughs> because it's the hardest thing, because, I mean, unless you are a sort of savant, regardless of what you do, for the first two years, you are shit. <laughs> and, it, it's, and so there is like a necessary process of self-examination and self-criticism, but it's just, I, I, again, there isn't really a silver bullet. All that happens is over the, over the years, if you just keep doing it and just be completely honest about yourself and your own work, you slowly start to disentangle what is structured. Would you say that that's fair? Yeah, like you slowly start true. to like, you know, you sort of, you slowly start to recognise what elements of your work are being recognised, are not being recognised because of all the sort of structural prejudices that are put in your way and succeeding. And then also sometimes there are times where you're just shit. Like there are things that you do that in your, there are things that I have done in my career that are just bad. Like it's one of those things where like, by things I mean the first five years <laughs> of my comedy was just shit. Uh, and that isn't necessarily what... That's what's... harsh. <laughs> was it? <laughs> <laughs> and there are some things you kind of go... It's, so, the thing is, sometimes it's both. And actually what it's about is for you, is uh, as you go along, you just start to sniff out when you're not getting an opportunity because of, because of whatever your thing is. But I would say the reason it's so urgent to try and change who gets to make culture yeah. and who gets to gatekeep is... I have seen some young women of a comedic generation 10 years below me being given opportunities and what happens when you give young women opportunities is they thrive mm. and it gives me life. And I, there's about three or four young female comedians from Britain who've gone to America and are fucking sailing and it's, it's a yeah. joy and you're like, ah, oh, it is the case that if you are denied certain opportunities at certain stages, you may not, you know, if, uh, it's like Formula One where like, if you don't get the car when you're 12, you can't bloody ever do it, you know? I, like you're talking thing, to the, the worst yeah, person yeah, about yeah, Formula I mean, One. But okay, so like, I have no idea. It's like being an I can't athlete. drive. Me neither. And I, really <laughs> I, know, I don't know why two non driving comedians <laughs> no, decided to engage. Not. I've seen Rush. Is that a thing? <laughs> Rush is a hairdresser. <laughs> But no, I, yes, I think you're absolutely. I think you're absolutely right. And I think also, ju I just want to slightly hijack what you're saying about this younger generation of female comedians to just say something else. Quotas fucking work. Yeah. They are. No one thinks that they are ideal, but they fucking work. About four or five years ago. Fuck, I didn't even 
put no, two and two together. Four or five years ago, the BBC, and they introduced it as, I love the BBC and I'll lay down my life defending it, but sometimes they have, they have a bit of a PR issue with their own stuff. But the way that they introduced it was not great. They just said, all they said was every panel show has to have one woman. Yeah. And what happened was men lost their fucking minds. And the thing is, everyone was like, this is not a meritocracy, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's they, a they, you, there's now so there's a whole more. generation. It's yeah. helped usher in a whole new generation of female comedians. And listen, it is not equality. I filmed Walk the Week last night. There were two women. That is not equality. But You're it's right, the start. The, yeah, 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 they should be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, the, it's definitely the start of something. It's and I true. have perceived I exactly the same thing as you've perceived. And I think about it a lot because I, I, I think about quotas and... You know, because, because, because every week of my life I've been told that everything I've got is because of a diversity hire. It's something that preys on my mind constantly. And, and what I would say is that you, you, when you're starting, you think, am I just shit or is this structural prejudice? And then if you have any success, you go, am I good or is this overcorrection for a structural prejudice. Like, you, you know, you, there's a lot of us who spend our whole careers going, well, this is clearly just because they needed a brown guy. Like, <laughs> and you're sort of made to feel like that by the way that you are written about. And but similarly, you, but remember fuck that shit. Yeah, like, your art is your possession. Yeah. And it's a wonderful possession because it can never be taken from you. Yeah. It's yours. And so the more you make, the more you can love it. And the more, I sound like a hippie, but the, so also, fuck all that noise. Yeah, a bit quotas, quotas work. Yes. They, they really do work. So if you're true. trying to redress structural imbalance, no one thinks that it's ideal that you have quotas, but quotas fucking work. Yeah.